As we have begun this year, this ministry year, it has been our desire to respond to what is a cultural phenomenon, perhaps even has impacted our church. In fact, I would say uh, for sure it has, and that is the de-churching movement, or I suppose you could argue the disengagement movement. And certainly it's been alive and well for 10 or 15 years in the cultural context that we live in. And certainly the separation and things that happened a few years ago did not help, but there's been a disengagement. A disengagement from God. We see a shrinking of evangelical Christians as defined by believing the Bible to be the word of God and the gospel to be the only way of salvation. We've seen a lack of commitment to attending and being involved in the ministry life of the church. We've we've seen a lack of engagement in life in general. And the impact on the culture is horrific and the price is being paid by so many in terms of isolation. And I suppose you could argue that there's all sorts of things that have contributed to this de-churching, disengagement movement that is not only in the church but in the culture. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on what has gotten us here, but rather how do we solve it? And so we solve it by experiencing what the Bible teaches about the greatness of God and engaging with the Isaiah 40, Isaiah 6, the the God of the Bible as he has revealed himself to us. He is great, he's sovereign, he's good, he's tender and holy, holy, holy. We saw that the only response to this God that is correct is a full devotion, a, a desire to be a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, a An offering of our lives in view and the context of the gospel to God. To use as he sees fit, open-handed as we have just sung. He doesn't need anything, but he's chosen to use us. And, And so we saw that this engagement must include, if we truly want to be followers of Jesus, an engagement with the local church, a a using of our gifts, a commitment to attend and to give and to serve and to steward who God has made us for the good of others. Now today, because it's Thanksgiving, we want to continue this series with a tiny bit of a break from Romans chapter 1. And so if you have your Bibles with you this morning, and I hope that you do, if you could open them with me to the book of Romans and to Romans chapter 1, where we find one of the most shocking calls to Thanksgiving in the entire Bible. In fact, as I have researched this and seen what others have done on Thanksgiving, very few would go to Romans 1 because... Romans 1 is a call to thanksgiving, to engage in thanksgiving, but it's, it's done in the context of a warning. It's like this danger sign that's flashing that so many just run straight through and don't pay attention to. So keep, keep your hand there and let me tell you a story of a, a young man who grew up in Alberta and fell in love with a young woman who was from Manitoba. Now, if you didn't know this, in Manitoba, there are no hills. It's flat. They have lakes. I suppose they have hills, but anybody from British Columbia or or Alberta knows that they're not really hills, they're garbage dumps. In Manitoba, as far as I know, there's no real ski hills. But when you grow up in Alberta or British Columbia, one of the rites of passage is you learn how to ski. And this young man, he skied a lot. His family went for ski holidays, he loved to ski. They went up to mountain, stayed for weeks at a time, and took lessons and loved to ski. And this young lady, although very athletic, had never learned how to ski at all. Now, part of being in love is wanting to do things together, and so the young man invited her to go skiing. And with great joy, she did, and he was very patient and kind and compassionate and amazing and (laughs) taught her how to ski, and they went to a little hill called Fortress, which, if you're from the prairies, is a massive mountain, but if you're from BC or Alberta, just a small little ski hill, and they learned how to ski, and then they went to what was Pascapoo, now Canada Olympic Park, and they skied there. And then, thinking the beauty and glory of the mountains would be something that would be very romantic for this young lady, he took her to a place called Norquay. Now, Norquay, Mount Norquay, is just outside of Banff, and it's a beautiful mountain, and actually very, very easy to ski. It's a very simple mountain, unless you go to the top of the mountain, and there it's only what are called Black Diamond Runs. Now, if you're from Manitoba or Saskatchewan, understand that Black Diamond is not a good thing if you've never skied before. 
But this young man had decided that he wanted her to see the beauty and splendor of the mountains and to experience the romance of being with him. And besides, she's a very good athlete. Very good, in fact. And so he took her to the very top of the mountain. And as they got off, they kind of skied down, she barely making it, him trying to show off because he was so great and so wonderful. And he got down to the place where there was a sign and it said, Danger Cliffs. She was not very happy with her wonderful, amazing, perfect boyfriend. But he said, it's easy. We'll just ski down. We'll go slow. It's not that hard. But unfortunately, this day, there were many moguls there. Now, moguls aren't all that bad. You just ski in between them. It's fairly easy. But if you're just beginning, regardless of how good an athlete you are, moguls are scary and cliffs scarier. Now, I hadn't... Oh, sorry. This young man hadn't been... (laughs) to Norway before, and he didn't know how risky this was or even how to get her down. But in his brilliance, he decided he would show her. And so he looked at the side and saw that there were cliffs over to the right and cliffs over to the left. So all you got to do is stay in between. It was at least 30 feet wide, lots of space. And so he skied down to the bottom of this what he thought was just a small area to show her how to get down, again, graciously, slowly. And he looked back up and she hadn't moved. In fact, she was sitting down and yelled, and now it felt much longer because I could, he could barely hear her voice. <laughs> I'm not moving, there's cliffs everywhere. So I, again, graciously tried to coach and move her down and she started over and then lost control and she got a lot closer to the cliff than I was comfortable with. So I took off my skis, went up, and together we slid down, and then slid down, and then slid down, and we did not acknowledge the warning signs, and I not only put my girlfriend at risk, but my relationship with her, because I was not aware of the danger. The Bible has warning signs for us, and some of them are very serious, And sometimes when we go to those warning signs, we ignore them, and that is to our peril, the peril of our world around us, and the peril of everyone we know and love. Romans 1 is this fantastic introduction to maybe the richest doctrinal book in the entire Bible. It's Romans or Isaiah, in my opinion. And Romans chapter 1 lays out the foundation in terms of the glory and power of the gospel, verses 16 to 17. Really, the obedience that comes from faith, 1 verse 5, maybe the purpose of the whole book of Romans. And then it jumps in after verse 17 into this terrifying decline. Or I suppose this flashing warning sign. Listen, there are cliffs here. If you don't listen, if you don't obey, if you don't follow this, there is a massive danger that you need to be aware of. And you say, Pastor, what does that have to do with Thanksgiving? Well, I'm glad you asked. The danger defined is where I want to start. And I think Thanksgiving is a fantastic day for us to realize how important it is to be those who honor God and give thanks to his name. I want to get to verse 21, but I want to get there in context. So I want to start in verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. That sounds wonderful. That foundationally beautiful. No warning there. Now the warning. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. There is a demonic conspiracy against the church and against humanity to suppress the truth to distort it, to distract us, and we we should see that all around us. It's fairly obvious if you watch the news or go to school or even in some of our workplaces. There is an attack on truth. For it can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. 
For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Very strong here. We won't take the time to develop it, but in essence what it's saying is creation reveals the greatness of God, and anyone who has been in the mountains understands and has seen that or on the ocean or really anywhere in the world. Now, the verse we're going to settle in on, the warning, danger, sign, verse, cliffs ahead. If you continue to ski over these cliffs or stumble, you will die. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. Did you realize how important thanksgiving to God is? Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. They put man at the center and lost sight of God. What is the danger that this chapter is shouting out? The conspiracy against truth that is so obvious? How, how do we see what danger this is for us so that we can be in the world but not of the world? We can live as those who are victorious in this massive, dangerous issue? And the answer is, if humans don't acknowledge God and honor God and give thanks to God, then he will give us over to our own sin. If you were to keep on reading in this passage, you would discover that one of the things that God gives us over to is the consequences of this truth that is confused, this distorted truth, and that is, in this case, sexual sin. Not in this chapter bringing about the wrath of God, although in other places it does, 1 Corinthians 6 specifically, but in this chapter saying that's a a consequence of not honoring God of of not giving thanks to him. Here's the warning light that is flashing and I hope seen by all of us. We want to be those who are radically God-centered. And we covered that in the first series on Engage and hopefully you hear that all of the time. We also want to be a people who live our lives constantly, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, to 18, in thanksgiving to God. I said this is a warning. If we don't, what will happen? I want to run through some things fairly rapidly as to what will happen if we don't give thanks to God. And I, I want you to notice that most of these are actually easy to see in the culture we live in today. Most of these, if you were to just watch the news, you would say, this is obvious. Or if you were to go to a school or or do those sorts of things, interact with your neighbors, most of these are on display because, as a culture, we put man at the center and created things as more important than God, how we feel more important than his truth, and we've stopped living our lives in relationship with him, defined here as giving him thanks. Context of the gospel, we'll get into that a little bit later. What do we lose? Verse 21, if this danger is not noticed, we'll lose our ability to think. Literally, we'll lose our ability to see life and think correctly about life. Futile, empty, useless in their ability to think. You see, what happens when we start to reject the God of the Bible and start down a pathway of unrighteousness, choosing ourselves over God, choosing our feelings over his revealed word, is that our thinking becomes messed up. So what we think is good is actually bad, and what we think is bad is actually good. Our thinking ability is foolish or confused, and it is dangerous, damning, and something we must fight against. And yes, we fight against it by learning how to think. Yes, We fight against it by being word-saturated, but in this text, the way we fight, and we'll get into this a little bit more, is honoring God for who he is and giving thanks to him. We lose our ability to think if we are not those who listen carefully to the warning signs. Secondly, we lose joyful emotions. There's a danger that 
hits us in terms of seeking satisfaction somewhere else but not finding it. And it's interesting, when you study the Bible, we are to be those who are emotionally engaged, emotionally engaged in life, emotionally engaged with God, and a danger of not honoring him for who he is and not thanking him, living a life of thanksgiving, is that we will actually become those who pursue joy and satisfaction somewhere else, but always come up empty. A.W. Tozer says it's something like this. Idolatry begins in the mind when we pervert or exchange the idea of God for something other than he really is. And he moves on to say, and this leads to emptiness, not satisfaction. Jeremiah 2, 12 to 13 describes this, the Israelites doing this. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares Yahweh. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and hewed cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns, cisterns that can hold no water. What, what's it saying? It's saying God wants us to experience joy and an overflow of emotion that is a delight in him, a satisfaction in him. And if we don't acknowledge him as God, if we don't live lives of thanksgiving, then that will be removed. We'll go to self and sex, and entertainment, and materialism, and all sorts of worldly idols instead, and those are empty and devastating. Overflow of that, perhaps, pleasure. Verse 24 talks about this a little. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forevermore. Amen. Here saying, if you don't honor God for who he is and give thanks to him, you will pursue pleasure, satisfaction in an empty place, same or similar to the previous one, and it will include, and certainly our culture is here, sexual sin. Sin that we're given over to to defend and I suppose think we're delighting in, but it will lead to destruction. So here, Romans 1, as it begins this incredible doctrinal book, is saying, in essence, danger, danger, danger. Danger if you don't do what this book asks or requests or desires. I suppose if we think of it in terms of being from God, which it is, demands then you will find yourself lost in your thinking, empty in your desires, and hurting yourself in your pursuit of pleasure. Not only unsatisfied, but devastated. When we meet as pastors, one of the things we will often say as we discuss things that are going on in the world, if only... If only we could see where sin leads, then we would choose not to sin. If only we could show our people, God's people that we serve, where sin leads, then they would choose not to sin. Because sin is like poison. It's something that devastates and destroys, and yet people willingly choose. Well, I think it's worse than that, because the Bible tells us where it leads, if we choose to live life outside of God, who God has declared himself to be, and outside of that personal response of, of thanksgiving, of praise, then there will be destruction, devastation, and it's a horror. That's the warning. What's the direction we're to take if we want to heed this warning? For me, it would have not been to take Lori up to the highest part of Mount Norquay and terrify her for an hour as we crawled down on our boots and let our skis go down on their own. For us, it's realizing here and now how to move in a direction so that when we are tempted and when that world creates all sorts of environmental things that cause us to fear or to fight, we instead revert back to what this text will call us to do. And I, I want to just walk through the direction, the pathway, and Romans is fantastic. It will actually take the entire book, all 16 chapters, to walk you down this. But, but notice first, verses 16 and 17, faith is the step we must take. Ephesians 2 would say it like this, for it is by grace you are saved through faith. Hebrews 11 would say it like this, without faith it is impossible to 
please God. Faith is an acknowledgement of the reality of who God is and what God has done. And in Romans 1, 16 to 17, it is that faith that allows us to experience the good news of the gospel. Faith accepts God's perspective and responds to God's plea with us so that we can be forgiven and live for his purposes. Faith is much more than intellectual assent, but never less. It's much more than how we feel, but never less. It's much more than what we do, but never less. See, faith is acknowledging what the Bible teaches is true. In terms of salvation, it has some very important things. We need to acknowledge that God is holy, holy, holy. The creator, the one who defines reality, created reality. We need to acknowledge that we sin and fall short of the glory of God and that that makes us, according to his word, his enemies, objects of his wrath. Those rapidly moving in another direction and because of his righteousness, those who deserve eternal damnation. But God, who is rich in love and mercy, sent his one and only son, Jesus. And Jesus lived a perfect life and then died on the cross, taking upon himself the penalty that I deserve, that I owe, and giving me his obedience, his righteousness. Now, I want to stop for a minute in terms of intellectually understanding this. If we actually believe this, it will be impossible to steal our thanksgiving. Now, I know we all struggle at times and the depth of our faith needs to constantly grow. I'm not not talking about saving faith. I think you can have saving faith and struggle. In fact, we all do. What I'm saying is, if we grow in this faith, our understanding of it, the richness of the gospel, then an overflow of overwhelmed thanksgiving will just be a part of who we are. How could it not be? He who knew no sin became sin for me. So that in him I might become the righteousness of Christ. If, if that's true, and it is, then I can't help but overflow in thanksgiving. If and when I'm not thankful, which happens once in a while, more often than I would like, it's because I've lost sight in terms of my walk of faith of the reality that God has so clearly given to us in his word. We, we need to understand faith involves my, my mind, my head. It, it's resting in the reality as God defines it. This text is so clear. There's a, an attack on truth and a revelation of truth. And faith says, I will take God's word over the world and the worldly way of thinking all of the time. And this is not easy. We need to be, as Romans will go on to say, word saturated. But it's more than just being word saturated in terms of knowing it in our minds, that it impacts how we feel. The heart, the head, the heart, the, the overflow of this delight in God and thankfulness and joy that we can't contain. I love 1 Peter in this. You remember 1 Peter is written at a time where within the next 10 years, most of these people would be under intense persecution, many of them killed. And Peter talks about this inexpressible and glorious joy that can't be stolen by by circumstances because you believe, you have this faith that then overflows. Reality is what God declares it to be, not what we feel. And so what we feel becomes based on the reality he has declared. Head, heart, hands. Faith will always involve how we live. Faith without works is dead. We're not saved by what we do, but when we're saved, we will do. Genuine faith always produces passionate obedience. Jesus declares this maybe most powerfully in Matthew 7, verse 21. Many of you will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not do all of these things in your name? And I will declare it to them, depart from me. I never knew you. And you go, well, wait a minute. They were doing all these things. And you go on to listen to Jesus. And basically what he says is, those who hear the word of God and put it into practice are those who truly believe. 
So this faith that we're to have, this Romans 1.16, the, the power of the gospel now through faith, through this response of our minds, we believe God's reality, our hearts, the experience then of joy and thankfulness, our, our overflow is this great delight and thanksgiving. Faith. And so we constantly need to be those who battle for and develop lives of faith. Oh, it's God's gift, but we are responsible. Thanksgiving, biblical thanksgiving, is always an overflow of faith. I suppose I've said that, so I would say this pathway will include now decisional thanksgiving. Oh, I hope it's overflowing. I hope it's something that's just a a matter of who you are, but I know you well enough because I know my own heart that often we feel we have this stolen from us because of the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And yet this joy, this thankfulness, this response to God is to supersede every circumstance we're in. Is that not what 1 Thessalonians 5.18 teaches so clearly in every circumstance we're to give thanks, and that's God's will for us. But what are we thankful for if the world is falling apart? What are, we, what are we thankful for if we're sick or broken or relationships are falling apart or the pain of our lives and situations feels overwhelming or the confusion and anxiety is creeping in and destroying? Well, what do we do? Well, I suppose we've already said it, but we should be thankful for our salvation. It's all of grace. Meaning what we deserve is wrath. What we receive is sonship. What we receive is intimacy with God, forgiveness, freedom, eternity with him, reconciliation. That This is amazing. And if we understand it, and if we experience his love, then that joy from being saved will supersede everything else. And thankfulness will overflow. Thankfulness is always, biblically, in the context of who God is and what God has done for us, and almost always in the New Testament in the context of salvation. But that's not all. God's at work in us not only to save us, but to keep us saved and to purify for himself, this is Titus 2, a people who are his very own, eager to do what is good. I'll I'll call the first salvation, I'll now call this sanctification. God's at work in us, he's helping us to follow him, He's, he's helping us to live with purity and passion and for his purposes. God is not a God who saves and then lets go. He's a God who saves and then changes. And we need to be thankful for that. We, we should be thankful for our salvation, thankful for our sanctification, thankful for his sovereignty, knowing that he is at work in every situation. Notice how the Bible, Romans 8, 20, 29, but so many other places, he's at work in every situation for our good and his glory. See, when you start to believe that, then all of a sudden, pain becomes something that you can say, I'm going to praise God in this. I'm going to consider it, James chapter 1, joy. I mean, that's impossible if you're worldly. It's only possible in the power of the Spirit if you seek to understand and see all of life through faith. And then service. I think so often we lose sight of this one, but isn't it amazing we, we sang earlier about the God who needs nothing, and that is true. The aseity of God, we call it. He doesn't need us. He doesn't, he doesn't need us relationally. He doesn't need us to do his work, and yet he has chosen to use you to offer love to someone else, to build his bride, to, to reach out with his gospel. Do you understand the amazing privilege of this? The God of the universe has said, Rob, fill your name in there, From eternity past, I had a plan, and that plan included you. I I saw you, and I chose you, and that plan included for you to do some things for me. Ephesians 2.10 would describe them as good works prepared in advance for me to do, and Rob, I I got stuff for you to do that will actually impact eternity. Psychologists tell us that to be happy, and I'm not sure they're right in this, but they tell us to be happy we need significance and security. Well, I'll tell you what, the only place where it can be found and never shaken is Jesus. 
significance. He chose me. He loves me. He died on the cross for me. Significance. He's got a plan for me. He's going to use me. Did you see how if we see life from his perspective, Thanksgiving is an overflow of that? I think we would be wrong if we came to this text and just talked about Thanksgiving because the text talks about so much more. There's some exchanges that go on and we want to be loyal to the text, even emphasizing what it emphasizes in terms of Thanksgiving. And so faith and then we want Thanksgiving and then this last word that's so important, verse 21, we want to be those who honor God. They did not honor me. Honoring God means seeing him for who he is and responding to him in reverence and worship and I suppose to use other biblical language to glorify him. To say, God, that's who you are. That, that's amazing. That, that's so wonderful. Have you ever been misunderstood before? I have too many times to count. That's one of the dangers of teaching and preaching. When you're misunderstood and someone who you are trying to bless feels cursed and then curses you behind your back, how does that make you feel? For me, I think, maybe the most devastating thing I go through as a pastor, I don't know about you, but it's, it's difficult. And yet, as Martin Lloyd-Jones would say, anything that anyone does to you that's negative is better than you deserve if you see yourself in light of the holiness of God. But imagine if Christians misunderstand God or ignore him, ignoring him here in the text, or even finding other places to go to worship and to be satisfied and to place their faith. And so they dishonor him by removing him from the center of their lives. Well, we see in the text that leads to destruction. We saw the danger sign. I just want us to notice this. The Bible's call is for us in this Thanksgiving to be radically Christ-centered. By this I mean he dominates how we think and feel and live. He dominates our minds and this dominance of Christ in us, the hope of glory, shapes how we live and speak so that we want with all of our might to bring him honor. I shared that when you're misunderstood and somebody dishonors you, it hurts. But to some degree, we all deserve it. Not God. Now it's this longing in my heart to say, I want every breath I take, everything I do, to show others how awesome you are. I've experienced your love. I've seen your grace, the splendor of your glory on display, and and yet you love me and notice me, and now I want others to see you in me and through me. This is what the Bible means when it talks about us completing the love of Christ. We actually become those who show others around us, both in the church and outside of her, how awesome God is. It's a radical God-centeredness. If we had more time, I'd show you how in this text the Deep sin of not being thankful and dishonoring God is a radical self-centeredness and living life by feeling, not by faith. We need to be a thankful people. So how do we apply this? Well, I hope you see a danger sign. Danger. If you're not thankful, it leads to destruction. Danger, if you dishonor God with your life or ignore him as God, as who he is and has said he is, it leads to destruction. It leads to a society that can't think, can't feel, is devastated, is sexually immoral, and thinks that's okay. Welcome to Canada. But we can be a part of bringing hope. And you say, how? It's... It's so big, there's so much destruction, there's so much confusion, there's so much distortion of truth. The conspiracy theory of causing this truth to be wrong is so strong in our country, and I think the answer is found in verse 21. Now to get there, I think we need an experience of the power of the gospel for salvation. But if you're saved... May I encourage you from this day forward to do two things every day, all the time. Every day, all the time. 
Be thankful. Number one, implication, be thankful. Be thankful. Start your day being thankful. Thankful to God, yes, that is essential and important. Please, please, please. Jesus, thank you. And as an overflow of that, thankful with one another. It is okay to say to someone you love over dinner or someone you barely know over a conversation over coffee at church, I am so thankful God has chosen to use people like me. I am so thankful God saved someone like me. I am so thankful God, God has chosen to use me to accomplish his purpose. Doesn't that make you thankful? And yet so often we would rather talk about politics or sports or brokenness of society. We can be thankful when the world falls apart because our Savior is on the throne. Do you see him? Do you know him? Be thankful. Secondly, be honoring. Again, I I want us to see it from the negative, verse 21, but to the positive. For although, this is the foundation of where we're going for chaos and there's more. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. Honoring him as God means that we know him biblically for who he has declared himself to be. And we live in such a way that displays his truth, his grace, his character. And and I said I wanted this to be something that marks us all the time because the Bible calls for us to be marked by this. For whatever you do, how encompassing is that? For whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all for the glory of God. Do it all to honor him. And one of the best ways we do that is the constant overflow of thanksgiving. I'm so thankful for Jesus. I'm so thankful I get to serve you by studying God's word and seeking to help you grow. I'm so thankful I'm accepted by God because of Jesus. I'm so thankful I'm found in Christ. I'm so thankful that God is sovereign so when the world is falling apart and terrorism is occurring, I can still trust in him. I'm so thankful he calls me his son and loves me personally. I'm so thankful I'm a part of his family. I'm so thankful that if I carried on... (laughs) or at least I should be so thankful that if I carried on, we wouldn't get turkey this weekend. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Would you help us to see you, to know you as you have revealed yourself through creation and through your word so that we would honor you for who you are and thank you for what you have done. Forgive us when we are selfish and dishonor you. Forgive us when we sin and don't show your glory, fall so short of it. Give us a new and renewed passion to be a thankful people and to be a people who honor you and to see that that is the best way we can impact the culture that we live in. For we long to see this culture be a place where a renewal of devotion to your truth, to your gospel, and to your person occurs. So would you fill us with your spirit? Give us a strong faith, a deep devotion, a delight and thanksgiving, and a desire with every breath we take to honor you. In Jesus' name, and for his sake, amen.